just as a quick reminder to anyone who missed last stream, let me bring up what we completed. So, uh, last week, let me actually move Fusion back into its spot and then bring back a photo. There we go. Uh, we created this module from Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Hey, Cool Doom. Glad to see you back today. Uh, and toward the end of the stream, uh, I was realizing that it kind of looks a little silly with how tiny the buttons are on the face of it. Um, in the actual model, it's quite, they're quite small. Uh, but I wanted to verify it. So, I have printed the module. And once again, the buttons are invisible. <laughs> um, let me actually see if there's a way I can just kind of disable that temporarily. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, there should be a way to do it here. Let's see. Filters. Oh, there we go. I'm going to turn off the green screen for a second there. There we go. Now you can actually see the colors. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it is uh, it is backwards. My camera is mirrored. Um, so I thought, I thought it was all right, but they really do feel small on this giant panel, um, especially when you compare them to the original. They look real small. So, uh, I did some research, and I found a source for larger buttons. Um, in fact, buttons that almost perfectly fit. Um, so these are standard 33 millimeter arcade buttons. These are 44 millimeter arcade buttons. So, um, while I don't have all of the buttons necessary, I was able to get a hold of a couple of them. And so, oh, let me uh, turn my green screen back on again. There we go. Uh, so... I think first order of business today will be going back into Fusion and trying to model in the new larger buttons. Um, because while this is definitely neat, having the actual one and being able to mess with it, um, seeing it in person with the size, they really do just feel weirdly small on the panel. Um, especially when the original Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes module... Uh, which I'll bring a picture up of here. Uh, let's see here. Actually, I, I realize I've never actually brought up the game on stream, so maybe that would be a... Uh, let me actually bring it up in game. I feel like that might be a better way to show it. I'm just going to temporarily switch this back while I get the thing loaded up. Um, can't get a set. <laughs> I, I actually found out a uh, one of the many um, kind of... Uh, here, here in the U.S., we often have uh, what I'll call bulk resellers uh, on places like Amazon and eBay. Um, and one of them actually has started, they were out of stock for ages, but they have started carrying standard 44 millimeter buttons. So I was able to get a source for them finally. Um, these ones I originally ordered from uh, AliExpress, which is a direct Chinese reseller. Um, and it came with two white buttons and no blue button, which meant I couldn't actually use them. Uh, <laughs> so sadly that, that was kind of disappointing when I got those in the mail and realized that they had sent me no blue buttons. Um, but found a new source. So hopefully we'll be able to, uh, I should have those in tomorrow, the full colors, but for now I just have a white in place of the blue. Yeah. I, it's actually a source I know as well, um, which I've used before. So hopefully, uh, it'll be all right. <laughs> I'm going to try, let's see if this uh, works. Haven't actually tried bring. oh, that's weird looking. Why is it? Okay, we'll see how this works. I've, I haven't actually tried bringing up a item on stream before. So let us see if I can actually bring it up. Uh, let's see. I was to that. And 
see. Okay, vanilla, Simon says, start. Okay, so let's see if this uh, actually works. I haven't tried, I mean, in theory it said, let's see here. Um, so this will also reveal a little how, of how I test things as I'm going. Um, there is a mod that provides you with practice uh, where you can fill in the game version with entirely a single module. Um, this is how I've generally been doing uh, when I go through and decipher. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a little weird seeing it in game uh, compared to the what I have here. I'm actually very happy with how close I was able to get uh, with the actual, I mean, again, mirrored, sorry, but uh, with the actual appearance of the module, I think I got pretty close um, as far as the real look between them. It's just the buttons that are severely undersized right now. <laughs> um, and so with how undersized the buttons are, I really, I kind of, I really want to make it look like the one uh, in game. So I think I want to upscale these buttons. I think that's worth the effort. Um, and then we'll be able to get the blank. Obviously, I can't make them have the exact same, uh, like, painted glowing effect that the game uses, because uh, it's kind of a cartoon shader effect. But I can at least get pretty close um, with real buttons. And yes, I, uh, it was a, a community search we did a while back where we did actually try to find uh, an old real game that looked like this and sadly no version of Simon uh, actually exists that is square for some reason um, all of them have so, uh, some kind of logo in the center or their circles or they have cutouts or something else so yeah uh, we, we had to, we're having to create our own um, but yeah so that that's what they actually look like in game you can kind of see then also the bulb shapes and the, um, the casing itself is significantly different uh, I did actually go through later on and measure, and these are smaller than this module. Um, in VR, you can play this game to scale uh, and get a good idea of it. And so I basically uh, measured with a ruler in, phys in real life while like comparing it through the VR headset to get an idea. And I think they are closer to 120 millimeters across instead of the 150 or 15 centimeters this module is. Uh, but I also think that some of the modules are impossible as they're shown. Um, so mine will just be bigger. <laughs> um, specifically, uh, this dimension here will be roughly half a meter on the one I make, um, which is kind of giant. It's going to take up a lot of space on a desk and probably will be too heavy to pick up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so that out of the way, um, this is also how I actually go through and uh, analyze the frames when I'm doing this. So I'll go through, solve a module while recording it, and then uh, go frame by frame and count up frames for how the timing works. Uh, so as an example of what something like that looks like after I'm done with it, I'll show a little bit of the process. Um, I can bring up the GitHub. And so Simon is actually one of the first modules I've done uh, a full breakdown of, because um, I do enjoy making these. So the full breakdown on Simon looks like this. Um, <laughs> so let's see, timer is 120, so it's hard to... Yeah, the, yeah, the, timer, uh, the timer module I think they're talking about, I'll grab one. Um, There's a fairly standard uh, clock face module uh, used by the uh, it's the 1.2 inch seven segment display. So it looks like this. Um, and this module has kind of been the universal choice. Uh, it's easy to get a hold of. Adafruit makes it so it's extremely compatible um, and the libraries are well written. And so this has, I think, yeah, I think it's Lucky, the Lucky Light uh, S18 11111. <laughs> it's the actual module name. But this particular seven segment display, this large 1.2 inch one, is a really popular choice. And so 
this dimension as it is is about 12 and so a lot of people have used that as their reference dimension um bunch a little larger <laughs> um partly that allows me to center this which is nice because you can see there is a an uncentered edge within this dimension itself um and so compared to the module size you kind of see how mine is uh, I, have, I have some edge work on the edge, like I have some edge space that also allows me to have these tabs without any issues. Um, so I can emulate the original appearance a little better. Uh, yeah, 130 I think is actually a really nice balance um, between keeping like realism and also the size limitation. Um, the reason I chose 150 was actually because of mazes. And the way I wanted to approach mazes using pre-built modules, there wasn't a way to fit that spacing in uh, to 130. So I just chose 150 as a nice round number that I hoped would work, and it so far went all right. Um, but yeah, so this is what I've determined with Simon through frame counting and a lot of other random things. So basically, and th this is what I will create before I go into... Programming. This is basically the programming guide I use. Um, so it's kind it's kind of a, a word version of what happens. So random sequence of uh, length three to five on start. Sequence does not change. That's actually something I found out via trial and error. Uh, it turns out that the sequence is determined before you even press the button at the beginning. So if you somehow guessed the sequence all the way through, you can solve the module before it even tells you what the first step is. Um, there is absolutely no restriction on how fast you can enter the stages. But it's essentially impossible to actually get three to five at random correct uh, by guessing. What I did for that is I used that module from before and basically just spammed, I think it was red, to see if I, if I could, uh, and then went through the footage. And I was able to find a spot where the actual solution was red, 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 and then something. And so I was able to hit red, um, let's see, I hit red one, two, three, four, five, I guess six, yeah, I was able to hit red six times without it striking, because it went first stage, so one hit of red, then it went to second stage, so red, red, third stage, red, 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 and if it had only been a length of three, that would have meant I won, but it was probably a four or five, so I striked out, um... Then frequencies, uh, they're oddly specific. I have no idea why, um, but they are 50, uh, 551.4 hertz, 660.7 hertz, uh, 777.6 hertz, and 977.5 hertz. They are pure sine waves, um, and they are 0.5 seconds long. This was done by basically ripping the audio files out of the game and then doing a for fast Fourier transform analysis on them. And then the actual blink cycles of the game, which I think are pretty interesting, um, are, so it begins blinking at the very beginning of the game, uh, literally the first frame it begins, uh, so all modules are synced at the very beginning of the game. Um, they always fade up with a 0.05 second fade in, they always are on for 0.03 seconds, and then fade back out with 0.05 seconds. Uh, these aren't perfect because 60 frames a second does not divide equally. I'm just kind of getting to the closest numbers. Um, there's a gap of 4.75 seconds between each blink, uh, or set of blinks, and upon hint hitting a button, it immediately overrides whatever is going on. So if you press a button, it immediately will begin turning on the button you've pressed and will play the tone instantly. Which I found was very interesting because any time the module itself plays a tone, it actually starts playing it 0.05 seconds after the, the button begins lighting up. So there's a, a, a tiny bit of visual indicator before you start hearing the sound. But they made it so that that doesn't happen. When you press it, it immediately makes the sound. Which I think is about the... Probably it was a decision they made for making it feel more responsive when you're pressing it even though when you're seeing it happen, it feels more right for it to start glowing ever so slightly before it makes the sound. Um, which is correct for how humans actually see. We hear after we see something. Um, because even though it's a minuscule amount of time, the speed of light is a lot faster than the speed of sound. 
So I think that's one of those, uh, you always want to make sure when you're doing audio editing or effects on something that the sound comes, if it has to be one way or the other, the sound needs to come after the visual indicator. Because if the sound comes before, it just feels wrong. Our brain isn't willing to make the concession that somehow the sound got here before the sight did. So just like lightning happens before thunder, the light needs to turn on before the sound happens if they're not happening at the exact same time. Um, something I learned in, when I did a lot of video editing and audio editing a while back. Um, so I think that's why they've done this, where they've made it instantly responsive when you press it yourself, but it's actually delayed whenever the module itself is making a sound. Um, Besides that, I mean, so any button press is an instant. If you make a correct button press, it waits 1.6 seconds and then shows you the next stage. Uh, then waits 4.75 4, uh, seconds before repeating itself. Um, if you make an incorrect mistake, or uh, make a mistake, it instantly strikes and makes the sound. Then makes you wait 4.1 seconds before it allows you to see the sequence again. So it pretty actively punishes... Uh, like, basically, it's not quite as bad as if you missed something. So if you miss something, you have to wait a whole roughly five seconds before you'll be able to see the sequence again. Um, whereas, if you mess up, it makes you wait about four seconds before it lets you see the sequence again. Um, and then finally, there is the whole uh, which one is which uh, based on your strike count and whether there's a vowel in the serial number. Um, I've just coded this as... RB, uh, RB, red, blue, green, yellow, and then this is the remap that each one would happen. Um, this is a very concise way to show it as a programming perspective. This is a terrible way to actually play because the manual is actually more clear than this, uh, technically. But yeah, um, oh yeah, and, and if you wait more than 4.75 seconds, it doesn't accept an input and basically reverts back to uh, as if it hasn't been pressed, so... Uh, if you were to press red, realize that, that you actually didn't know what kind of came next, you would have to wait 4.75 seconds from your button press for it to start going through its sequence again. Um, so yeah, this is the timetable for how this module works. This is kind of how I go through things uh, personally. When I'm reverse engineering, uh, when I want to make a prop or something, I will record footage, go through frame by frame, um, and basically make graphs and charts of what I'm, what's going on as, a, as the events occur, so that then I can go back and program based on those timetables I've created. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of making charts for whatever I'm doing. Um, they're not really necessary, and in fact, I think I can... I don't have it with me. Let me go grab it. You can see what this originally looked like. There it is. So I actually began this project uh, over winter break last year. And at that point, I had no idea what I was doing physically. Um, <laughs> so I created uh, over break. I didn't have access to the internet for the most part, but I did have the game on my phone, uh, the Android version. And so I went through with my... Uh, paper notebook. I'm actually going to see if I can flip my camera around the other way around so you can see the right way around. Um, see here that. And then transform. Uh, let's see. Properties. Nope, not that. Filters. Add. Transform. There's a transform somewhere in here. Uh, oh, maybe mirror is only available as a... Still learning OBS a little bit here. Transform, here we go. Uh, flip horizontal. 
And boop. <laughs> Didn't think it would animate that. That's fun. Um, so I have a paper notebook I went through. And let's see if I can find the page for Simon, the original one. Um, yeah, so as an example, like keypads. I have all of the symbols I saw re-recorded. The different orders in their tables. Um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm glad it came out on phones. Uh, it makes it so much more accessible. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, some of them, like Simon says, are just massive when written out uh, on paper. Um, although it does reveal... Doing something like this does reveal really funny things about the game. So as an example, in the actual instruction manual, uh, let me bring up what... Uh, my favorite is probably... Um, so this is my actual manual. Um, <laughs> so if I bring up um, the actual page for, here we go, who's on first. You can see that they have an entire wall of text. Yeah, they actually reduced the price. I think I got it on Android for like $4 when at the time. Um, I think I own like five copies of this game, though. <laughs> um, I've bought on just about every platform I could get it. Um, so you can see they have a whole wall of text. Like, it's very nicely organized. They're all the same length, even, which must have been a ton of effort to make sure that, like, they all line up along the edge perfectly. Um, like, yeah, it's super, super nice looking. Thing is, um, that's completely irrelevant to the actual game. Yeah, and this is uh, the case with lots of things. Um, because if you see, uh-huh, the first item in the list is uh-huh. So the actual useful list is just uh-huh. It's just the single word. There's n Everything that came after it in the original manual is complete useless. Like, will never apply to the situation. Um and that's, a, that's the case for a lot of things in this game, is they add additional detail that is only useful because it makes it look nice. Um, which is kind of ironic in that that's, like, you appreciate it in the instruction manual, but also, uh, yeah, it's just unnecessary. Um, <laughs> like, even Morse. Some of these letters are never used, uh, in, in the actual one, they put numbers there. Never never a useful thing in the game. Um, and, of course, everyone's favorite uh, over... Like, they made this one of these beautiful quadruple Venn diagrams. There's, like, no worse way to show information. Like, it's insanely concise, but also absurdly difficult to read. Um, I do have a special version of the manual I've made notes in that I use sometimes. But, uh, so when it came to Simon... What I had originally documented, because a lot of these I actually write these notes out before I make them in the computer, because I'm weird and doing stuff the old way, was this. <laughs> so you can see that the the basically the same charts I made on the computer and same notes I had originally made in my notebook um, throughout the process. <laughs> um, and there's there's also some weird. Uh, notes in here. So like when I was creating the maze, you can see the uh, layout I made for the LEDs, which was a nightmare. Um, but once I had made this once, I could use this array for everything else after that. Um, and then there's also prototypes like uh, when that, so some modules are impossible as they're shown in games. So as an example, um, the way that the game shows the module memory I can find it. These notes. And yes, I did draw these actually just by looking at the game on my phone. Um, <laughs> so that's memory in game, roughly. So you have the four numbers along the bottom, the one number on top. The problem is these four numbers on the bottom uh, in game are shown as if they are printed buttons, but they change, like the values on them change. So I went through and used Nixie tubes and created my own layout uh, to scale in my notebook. So this is what my version will look like when I actually end up modeling it. Um, and a few, a few of them I've had to do that. So I did that with uh, memory, 
I've also done that with Morse code and create a demo of what I want it to look like as if it's like an old radio tuner instead of going off of the uh, button based approach that they use in game because knobs are more tactile in my opinion than buttons are um, and they would be terrible like knobs don't make no sense on a computer but in in like when you're physically doing it they're great um, let's see what else was some of the fun things I found when I was doing them we're gonna move over to CAD um, oh yes so one of the other things that is uh, a fun detail is you have a lot of indicators and additional information that's on the edges, so edge work on the game. Um, the vast majority, and I think most people who have played a lot know this, the vast majority of edge work means absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> notice technical drawings. I've considered it. I've actually been... Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, I actually am a uh, training to become a teacher in engineering. Um, and engineering notebooks are a big part of that. And so I've actually been considering for a while now remaking this entire notebook um, in traditional engineering notebook style to have as, as my example for my students. Um, wouldn't be perfect because technically you're supposed to like do the stuff as you go in an engineering notebook, so I'd be kind of cheating by having it all be on the same day that I'm adding the information, but... Um, it also, I, I feel like this game is an excellent example of, uh, like, those kind of concepts with technology, communication, um, and a really good example for Arduino um, and CAD because of the simplicity of some of the designs. Um, so, I can hop back. Oopsie. Right, I can't transition between the same thing. Let me go, uh, so, boop. Filters. Nope, not filters. Uh, transform. Flip myself back the other way around. Boop. <laughs> and then we can hop back over into CAD. So, um, that was actually pretty fun to talk about that for a while. It's always nice to talk about, like, this is uh, probably my longest term project now. And I have a feeling it's going to be another year or two before it's complete at this rate. But uh, I enjoy that. It's nice to have a, a project I can come back to and work on periodically. Uh, so, given all that, I think we should redesign this for the new big buttons. Um, so this is kind of so. This is also a good concept for when you're doing complicated modeling like this. If you do everything right, in theory, this would be very little effort for us to go back through and change all of this. Um, so what I am going to do is I am going to make a copy of everything because it's good record keeping um, to make copies. So I'm going to rename this to the 33 millimeter and then I'm going to make a copy. New folder. Sign so says 44. Make copies of all of these. in how you modify all this. Yeah, so if you do everything just right in CAD, in theory this will be extremely easy. Um, because if I did... Now, I didn't do things perfectly, admittedly. I didn't use parameters. That probably would have been the best thing to do. Um, oh, I didn't mean to move that. Let me, let me undo that. Uh, yeah, move. I meant to copy, not move. See that copy to there. And I'm gonna have to make copies of all the buttons as well so I can modify them. Uh, rename. Yeah, we'll keep it that way. Copy explodes. Copy. Okay. So in this case, there are a few things I didn't do that would have made this a little simpler. Um, one of them would have been to have the buttons be all the same button uh, and being like attributes of it. But what we first need to do is we need to figure out what the difference in the buttons are. So 
I'm going to bring up the blue one as a start. And I'm going to disassemble one of these buttons I have here. Um, just to get a, the measurements. Now, what's interesting is that these buttons are actually very similar to each other. So if I bring up... Um, let me open up the white buttons of both. Um, a second here. And I'm not sure if this is, I believe this is because these are standard arcade buttons. They've decided to make them very similar to each other. Uh, but you can see that the actual like cylinder, the part that screws in in both of these, the bottom bit, is exactly the same. In fact, it's almost the same length too. Um, it is definitely the same diameter. So the circle won't change. Um, what is different is you can see that the thickness of the like tab is much thicker because this travels more. Um, and obviously the face on dimension, this is 33, this is 44. Uh, so that is a significant difference. So we only have to make a few changes to the actual dimensions here. Um, so if all goes well, we can actually just do this in these sketches. So we have 33 and 29.5 uh, for the originals. These are now, uh, well, 44. <laughs> um, and the second dimension we had there was basically how big this internal uh, dimension is as far as like, uh, it's hard to get the camera. Uh, where, where it's going to seat into the actual enclosure. And so on these, that is 39.6-ish. Um, we just have to make sure it fits fairly snugly here. So I'm just going around and kind of measuring um, different locations, not squeezing particularly tight, because we just want, I just want to make sure this always slots in easily. And so it looks like it's going to be somewhere in the range of 39 point, 39.5. Um, so we're going to change this to 39.5. And now, if everything... So when I hit finish here, it's probably going to something horrible is going to happen. Because I just changed two dimensions in. <laughs> okay, it didn't actually go horrible. Um, you can see that the outer dimensions changed, but the inner button stayed exactly the same. Um, which is actually one of the best results that could have happened. That means that things went fairly well overall. Um, so we have some other... But basically what I can do is I can actually undo the history of what we did yesterday. And bring it all the way back to when it was like a brick shape. Um, and I'm also going to bring back my appearances panel and make this that color so we can see again. Um... So you can see as I move in these features, they're all coming back. And I'm going to basically just remeasure each feature as I go to make sure I'm not doing something incorrectly. So this was uh, yep, 3.7. So that, that measurement. Ah, so that, okay, so measurements have changed. So one measurement that changes this dimension here has changed. So if I go into this extrude, this was the amount from the top. This was this measurement right here was the one that we're changing here, I believe. And I'm going to double check that. So I cancel. I just want to see where my... Yes, okay. So there's this little gap dimension, this kind of inner gap, which on these is... 7.5 millimeters instead of the... Five millimeters. So basically, it got 2.5 millimeters deeper. Um, so 7.5. You can see that's a little deeper now. And then the top, I believe, is actually roughly equivalent between the two. Um, I'm going to double check though. I'm going to measure that. 3.2. Oh, interesting. It's actually a little thinner. I wasn't expecting that. So instead of 3.8, this is actually only 3 millimeters on the uh, larger buttons. The kind of cap, this little cap bit, is actually thinner. Uh, so then we're going to have that. And so this chamfer probably needs to be adjusted ever so slightly to match that. Um, 
I actually think that maybe it's not three. I think it's three point three. So I'm gonna hop back and change that again. Um, so this dimension would actually be three point three, and then this would be three point three minus one point five. And the second dimension would be uh, about 2.4, 2.3. So yeah, that's about, it's actually about the same. Um, we can then continue moving forward. So this sketch was the spot where we defined how big the button is. Uh, so I can just remeasure that. It's uh, 34.5. And in theory, by just changing that, the entire button should have changed. So let's see. It's recalculating it all. And yeah, it basically worked. Um, there's some little mistakes here and there, but yeah. So that, that's the advantage of modeling this way is that basically everything works uh, provided nothing serious changed during the process. You can see this colored area is a lot lower than the button now. Um, and so that is one of the things where an attribute has changed that wasn't based off of another feature. And anytime something isn't based on another feature, you're gonna have that issue. So that's fine. Um, that's probably fine. I think this button is actually less tall. So I'm gonna measure that real quick. So this, this extrude here uh, was offset by three millimeters. So that was the height of the button off of the surface. Uh, these new buttons actually have a little bit more, they're a little taller. They're about 3.5 millimeters up. Let me change that into 3.5. You can see that's gonna make our button just a little taller. Uh, then all of these realistically don't change. Uh, they were just for aesthetics and we don't really need to worry about changing them for that. Now, the hollow feature. Uh, I believe this is still going to be the same. I think this acrylic is probably the same thickness as what we had before, one millimeter. Uh, yeah, one millimeter is more than enough. Um, head off. Good. Yeah, thanks for dropping by. Um, it's always nice to have people stopping by these streams. Uh, I'm going to double check this. So I believe we had this be marked as one. Yeah, we had this marked as one. That's still good. Extrude. Now, this extrude changed. This is the extrude that we want to be right up next to that surface, but not quite touching. And so we need to change this so it doesn't quite... So it looks like about 9.67. 9.7. I think 8 is too far. Oh no, 9.8 works, okay, 9.8. And then we do our final effects. There we go. So now we have our new button. I hit save on that. We have our large buttons now. Um, let me actually recolor it to be the correct glossy black. We have our new button. Um, we will make copies of it shortly and use those uh, effects we made earlier. But we're now ready to actually modify this. So I'm going to delete the four primitives we had from before uh, by going into the timeline where we brought them in and basically undoing that. So somewhere around here, I think we brought them in. So this, 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 this. Delete all those features and bring the feature backs. Okay. So now we're back to where we're here. What we need to find is I need to find the features where I made those holes. So I believe it was somewhere around... Let's see. Oh, we're getting close here. That's for the magnet. Chamfers. Here we go. Okay. So this is the sketch that defines everything about what we're doing. Um, so, we just have to change that to match these new dimensions. We'll bring up the button again. We're going to open that same sketch. And so our new dimensions are 44, 39.5. So over here, this one should now be 44. 
And okay, failed to solve. So that's something that you'll see when uh, basically I, that dimension changed so much that it can't figure out what it's supposed to do when I changed it. So you see if I go like 35, it's able to change that just fine. But after I get to a specific point, probably when this overlaps there, it won't know what to do anymore because mathematically it doesn't make sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make this number bigger. I think I'm going to make it about 20. That's going to split them apart, which should give me the room I need to make this dimension all go all the way up to 44. Yep, so now it allowed me to do it. So that's one thing is that while technically the dimensions were all fine, we weren't close enough to the original numbers we had. And so just changing that, no like if we were to change all the numbers at the same time, it would have been fine. But because they, they were depending on each other, we had to change one, then change the other in a specific order. Um. <laughs> Just trying to throw random numbers in the chat. I mean, I, I'm going to cop back anyway because I want to make sure 39.5. Um, so this one would be 39.5. Like that. And nicely, this diameter actually doesn't change. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. Now, last thing, this number, we can actually bring back. You see these are actually sticking off the edge of the module, which is way too far. Um, so I'm going to bring this back to maybe, uh, let's try 10. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, they're still sticking off. Uh, 8. 5. So now they're just touching the edge of the, of the module, which is pretty close to where I'd actually want that to be. Um, however, this edge has become larger than the original buttons. So this, this size versus the original size is a little different now. Um, so I think it would be best to actually have these almost touch each other. Uh, personally, I always feel like having a little bit of an edge between two things looks better than having it. So if I have the, if I have these buttons right up against each other. Um, and I can kind of show this by on camera. If I have them right up against each other, because they're not perfectly round, or li like they're not perfectly flat with each other, there's like a little bit of a gap between them that's inconsistent. I personally prefer to have a little bit of an intentional gap like that, rather than trying to shove things against each other and have like a weird inconsistent gap. And so I'm actually gonna leave a little bit of a gap in CAD here. Um, just a little bit of one because I want it to look like there's a gap. Um, and we'll be able to, we can actually change this and see what it looks like different if uh, in a minute here. So I'm going to finish this sketch and it may get angry at me. So you can see down here in the timeline, I'm currently editing, oh goodness, where's that sketch? Oh, there it is. So you see how these are grayed out down here? Uh, I think I'm kind of in the way. Uh, I am in the way. So if I move out of the way, right here, these are grayed. These are not grayed out. That's where I'm working, that boundary. And so when I hit finish, it's going to try to recalculate every feature from there on, which it actually did without any problems, which is nice. Um, the other thing, though, is we this extrude here, uh, you remember, was 5 millimeters. These are now thicker. They're 7.5. So that needs to go deeper. And with that... So now there's a, l a lot less thickness with this second uh, face, but that should be everything we need to change. Um, that should be it done. Um, so that was pretty painless. Uh, and that's the nice thing about using parametric editing. Um, and so I'm going to save that as it is now. And we only have one button made at, th at this moment. Um, but, and let me finish that sketch and exit out. Um, hopefully I'm editing, yeah, I was editing the right one. Okay, I'm gonna save that. And we can go ahead and bring in the one button, uh, which would be the top one, the blue. And we'll see how that looks so far. So I'm gonna move this button out, okay. And then do joint from here to there. Okay, we have one of our buttons in. Um, you may notice they also look less bright than before. Um, 
That's because I decided to try to do a render yesterday for the fun of it. Look like this. And so I made the blue, the yellow, and the green not lit up uh, so that the red would look different from the others. Um, completely unnecessary, uh, but that's why they look different. I can change them uh, just by changing the number back. So, given that, I'm actually pretty happy with that, how that looks so far. So, I'm going to go ahead and create those other buttons. And what I'm going to do there is I'm actually going to, uh, because these are unrelated copies, I'm actually going to make copies of the original of the, the blue button again. Um, so, make copy. Yep. Copy. Copy. And then I'm going to rename them to be the different. Uh, I'm actually just going to call this 44 green. Rename 44 yellow. Rename 44 uh, red. And then we need a 44 blue. Rename blue. So what should have happened here is because I renamed that, if I close this, uh, you can see this name has already changed in here because these are all related to each other. And so when I hop into the green, I'm going to bring up the old green. There we go. So we have our new bigger button and we have our older button. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab this appearance. I'm going to uh, oh, right. Okay, so my appearances are a thing. Um, basically, I'm going to cut you. Yeah, I'm going to copy that to my appearances, hop over to this one, open the appearance panel, and bring up the my appearances. And you can see there's that one I made from before. And so I can apply that to, I do need to make that body visible. Apply that to this body. And then I can just remove it from the My Appearances, uh, but now it's in this document. I'm also going to delete the older version of it. There we go. Save. So now this one is green, and I can get rid of the older button we had. Because it is no, I've moved everything I need from it uh, over to where I am now. So we have our green button, and we open the what will be our red button, and our old red button. So this one is one of the one that's actually set to be lit up right now. Uh, so if I do appearances, red, copy to my appearances, move over to here, hide the body, appearances, grab the appearance and apply it. And then uh, bring that body back, save, okay. And I can hop back over here and remove that appearance. And finally, yellow. So we have our yellow button here. I'm going to grab the appearance, copy to my appearances, hop over, Hide appearances. Go. And we should be done. So if all goes well, we should now be able to just drag in, um, let's see here, there we go. So we'll be able to drag in those four other buttons we have. Um, I'm going to, so I'm actually going to do something a little weird here. I'm going to basically bring that back out. I'm going to import green, move it out, import red, move it out. And import yellow. Move it out. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically just bringing in these documents. Um, 
<laughs> they are a fun button. So what's interesting about these buttons, um, arcade buttons in general, that I find uh, is a bit interesting, you can actually kind of see it here, is there's two pieces to them. So you can hear there's a nice, uh, nice clicky button sound they make when you press them. Uh, but that's actually this button. So there's a little button that's attached to the LED stick that makes the click. The actual button itself is just a spring. So nowhere near as satisfying, but it gives a little bit of a, of a return force that's consistent. And so the buttons actually have a two-stage click. There's a beginning where it's just the spring, and then there's the click of that little button engaging. So it's actually two buttons, and I've actually found that that in general is something that a lot of good buttons have. So it's the same with these gigantic safety buttons. They have basically that same mechanic. And so in the bottom, you actually see there's like a two-stage movement. So there's stage one, which is the contactor, and then stage two is this spring moving separately. So you get a click move. And, and what's nice about that is when you're pressing a button, it means that this is where the button is pressed. This, this entire range here, the button is still pressed. And so that means that when you press the button in, you're not like on the border of being of the button being pressed. So if you're right on the border, if I'm if I'm holding it right here, it means that this this isn't a sound connection. A little bump could make it stop being pressed, which would be a problem. And so the nice thing about these two-stage buttons is that when you have it pressed in, there is no way you're losing the signal. Like, I can move like this. Like, I could, so my, because uh, it is hard to press these buttons um, for long periods of time. There's a whole range of movement you can make without actually losing the button being pressed. Um, which is good because you always want to make sure you know when the button is pressed and when it's not. Um, the other cool thing about this particular kind of button, these safety buttons, is you'll notice there's actually four contacts on it. And so a normal button will either have two, which uh, I think I have a button that is like that around here somewhere. Uh, let's see here. Where did it go? I've knocked it off the table at some point. Um, okay, I have no idea where that, where that button's gone. But uh, these buttons are the same way. They actually only have, so you can see there's three contacts on this one. So they have a one contact here and then two contacts here. There's a common and two. Now this button, I have a feeling, immediately snaps between the two buttons. So when it it's this way, this one is connected to here. When I push it in, this one gets connected to here. Whereas these really big buttons, these safety buttons, have four. And you can actually see, actually, in the button itself, what's going on is there are two contactors. So this one and this one are connected through that little metal strip on the inside right now. They're below the surface. They're kind of hard to see in there. When I start pressing the button, that plate rises up, and now nothing is connected. And then when I finish pressing it, it comes forward, and now this and this are connected to each other. And this or this are not connected. So there's no time in this button when uh, one of them is connected, where, where they're both connected. There's a, a, f a phase of nothing being connected at all. And so what's neat is that you can make it so that when I press the button, this is when it gets pressed. But when I release the button, it has to come all the way back to here to be released. So this middle area, it just remembers what it was doing before and keeps doing that. And so that's why these are safety buttons. This is an emergency stop button because of that attribute. Now, normally emergency stop buttons would have a thing where you press them and they would stay held like that until you twist to release. Uh, this is not that kind of button. This is a, you hit it to basically stop something. It's an e-stop, but not to re-engage. You'd have to start something else to re-engage it. Um, the reason I have this is for the button, uh, one of the modules, because... Actually, you can unscrew the button cap from it. So you can put your own button cap on the top, 
which is exactly what I, what you need in the button because there are 16 possible caps for the button. <laughs> uh, so what I can do is I can actually just unscrew each one as I need it. Um, this isn't exactly what I'll be doing for the real one. Uh, I will be screwing an adapter into this and then the actual caps, the faces of the button will be magnetically stuck on because I want them to always stay with the correct direction facing up. And because this is a screw, there's not really an up position. Like I can twist this a little bit as I'm tightening it and there's not a reliable up and I need a reliable up when I'm doing it. So, because if you labeled this button, um, it could move around a bit, even as now I can kind of twist this, um, which is not how you want the button to work in the actual game. So uh, there's going to be some changes to that, but that's the basic idea. Uh, okay, back, back to CAD. Uh, <laughs> I'm remembering today. Um, so I'm going to now do the joints. So we have these four pieces. They're just literally floating off in space right now, um, like that. They're just out and about. Um, so what I can do is I'm going to use those joint tools to lock them in place. So joint. Uh, so I'm going to continue and so it'll snap it back. And so blue is on the top. So here to here. I do love the little animation as they rotate into place. It's very satisfying. <laughs> um, going to do a joint for green. Green is on the bottom. <laughs> so, joint for green. Oh, come on. <laughs> joint for green. Green's in position. Joint for red. Red is on the left. Just have, I just want to make sure I'm getting the right. There we go. There's red. And finally, uh, joint for yellow. Yellow's on the right. Joint. There. Two. Come on. I want to move a little closer. There. <laughs> so there we go. We have our four buttons uh, connected up. So you can see that spacing I was talking about earlier. I have a little gap in between the buttons now. And I'm not sure if I like that gap. Um, just looking at the actual structure here, but this is, the, this is the advantage of parametric modeling. I can change it now. So we had that in, I believe it's in this, yep, in this sketch, we have a single number that controls the spacing. So if I go back into that sketch and change this number right here, uh, that's how I'll change it. Now what I can even do, which is really cool, is I can create a parameter in this, in this here. So I can go into user parameters, add one, and I'll call it uh, button spacing. And I'll put in five millimeters like it was before, okay. I can go back into that sketch we had, which is, uh, I think it's this one. Yeah, wait, no, this one. Go into here and actually type in, instead of five millimeters, I can type in button spacing, that name I gave it. Hit enter, you can see it now says F of X five millimeters, or FX, so, so it's basically a parameter now. Or is it perfectly touching? Yeah, so th that's the nice thing. We can change this now. So now that we've done that, I can actually just open up this parameters panel and change this number. So right now it's at five. I can just change it to four, hit enter, and there we go. It updates that as, as I, basically I can just change it on the fly and see what happens. Um, so I kind of agree with you there, actually. It looks like something around... Uh, I think it would probably be 3.5 or something in that range is probably uh, where they're basically touching, yeah. And I think that actually looks worse than the 5 we had. So having that intentional gap where it's just touching the edges or just about touching the edges, so it's almost touching. I think that actually looks pretty good. Um, 
Not sure if that spacing is the perfect spacing, but it's, defi it's definitely close. I guess we could do like 5.5 or, ooh, not, not 55. Um, oh, so, so this is actually, yeah, so I just typed something in entirely wrong. You see everything basically broke all of a sudden. Um, if you go too far within that with a parameter, you can, things can go real wonky real fast. You can see everything turned red and yellow in the bottom as well to tell me that something went horribly wrong. So I can still hit Control Z though. The wonderful thing about computers is you can undo things. So I can just go back to how it was before, bring back up the parameters, and change back to like 5. Point, uh, maybe 5.2. Is that going to be closer to if we wanted them to just touch? Maybe 5.5. pretty close not sure if that's better <laughs> um, I think I actually like the tiny bit of gap with five personally um, having that little bit of so that, that edge doesn't directly touch I feel like maybe that looks nicer um, something we could try to do is have this gap and this gap be the exact same so if we did that that would probably be something around four Uh, nope, 4 was too far. Uh, 4.5. If we did something like that, we have the same gap here as the gap here, roughly. Um, I don't know, maybe that is better. I'm going to hit OK on that. I'm going to save it. Let's see what this looks like if I hit Render. I go into the render tab. Hmm. So that looks pretty all right. Gap isn't perfect. I kind of wish there wasn't a gap, but it, I think it works in this circumstance. I actually do a canvas render start getting the lighting effect. Um, so by the way, what, what it's doing here, the reason it looks so grainy when it starts out is it's ra uh, ray tracing or ray casting. Um, so each of these little pixel grainy things is happening because it hasn't sent enough light beams per pixel to figure out what something will look like. So given enough, it just has to keep sending out more and more and more of them and as it averages out these slightly different uh, individual rays that it sends out from the camera, um, it gives a better idea of what it should look like. Um, in this case, I think it probably is, sent, yeah, it's probably sending them out from the camera and not the light sources. Um, it's more efficient to do it that way. Um, but it's basically trying to add, do what real light would do. Um, I think that looks pretty nice. That, that looks more like the Simon module from the game than our original one does. In fact, I think I can bring them up side by side here. Um, kind of, at least. So if I bring up the Simon Says 33 module we had before and bring it up in the render view. Wait for render to get figured out what it's doing. There we go. So I think between this and this. I definitely think this is a lot closer to what the one in game looks like. Uh, this one looks a little silly. <laughs> um, with its tiny little buttons on the gigantic face of the uh, module itself. Um, oh, now they look white because of the background. That's fun. What happens if I... Like, you can actually even see like the transition. That's fun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, in comparison to this uh, <laughs> it's a model one with itty bitty buttons just because <laughs> well I mean so technically because we've made this is uh, all parameter driven we can make like we can do something silly like that and make something tiny um, if, if we want to do that really quick let's just do it for the fun of it why not um, so I'm going to hop back over to 33 uh, in this case I will just um, I'm going to duplicate this and then let's see do. Um, let's see. Copy and then yeah, copy. 
So Simon, rename, silly. So let's make a, uh, what, what color should the buttons be? I'm only going to do one color for this just so we don't have to remodel all the, all four buttons again. Um, do we want blue, green, yellow, red, or something else? I guess we can always just change it. Um, red, red, okay. So I'm going to make a copy of the red button as well. Um, so copy uh, works. And then rename. Yep. Go. Open up that button. There we go. Gonna close out what we had before, and I'm going to open up the version that we are editing. So, let's make this button even smaller. Um, so we kind of can just pick numbers because we're not trying to replicate something real. So let's maybe go, I don't know, we'll make this uh, 10. <laughs> make this uh, 12. These will be 12 millimeter buttons. <laughs> so you can see basically everything went to error and it created like a weird little glowing cube. Um, because some of these numbers don't work now. So I'm going to have to go back a bit in time, in the timeline, um, and find where things went wrong. So here, that's fine. Uh, so this chamfer is a little aggressive now. So let's change this to uh, maybe uh, 1.5 and 1.5. That's probably still too big. Yes, still too big. Uh, let's go 1 and 1. So make that smaller. I'm also going to make this extrude smaller to make it more, uh, just make it look more like what the button should look like. Um, so we have this sketch here, which obviously makes no sense. It's humongous. So uh, let's go 11. Nope, still too big. Uh, 10. Uh, we'll, we'll actually go with 10. I'm going to change this to match it. So... Uh, what I need to do here is I need to make this ever so slightly bigger. Um, or sorry, not that bigger. I need to make this smaller. So this is two right now. I'm going to make it just one. And I'm going to change this to be 0.5. Just trying to keep numbers roughly in the right range to make it look like what we had before. Uh, we can now extrude. <laughs> Now extrude away. Okay, so right, um, that doesn't work because these numbers don't match. So this needs to be 11.5. There we go. So this extrude now works. We have our our tall button. Um, now these chamfers, it's going to be angry about probably, because yeah. So you see how this look, kind of looks weird. Uh, this chamfer was just too big of a distance. So this needs to be more like two. There we go. We kind of got our shape back again. Um, let's bring in the next feature. Okay, that's an error. Uh, this is too big. Two. Nope. One. There we go. Uh, this chamfer worked. This chamfer worked. The whole command worked, but is, is humongous, so we need to make this 0.5. Uh, the extrude is too big. Lower that so it fits within the boundary. And uh, that command went fine. These commands went fine. Okay, so there we go. We got our tiny button. <laughs> tiny, very tall button. <laughs> I'm going to save that. And we're going to need these dimensions we have here. So... We can hop back over to this one and basically do the same thing we did just a minute ago. I'm going to get rid of all the buttons we have here. I'm going to go back to that sketch, which is right. It's this one. Yep, the sketch. We can change these numbers. So this uh, is now, I believe we made 11.5. And that may get make it angry. We'll see. Uh, did not like that. Okay. Um, 
So this needs to change first, but this needs to change before that. So this would probably be like uh, five, yeah, maybe seven. And if we're lucky, we can change this one to, ah, that's why, okay. Um, so we need to change this to be bigger again, so maybe 20. And this should be able to be changed to 11.5. Yep, that worked. And I wanna double check our numbers here, 11.5, 12. 12. <laughs> Let's see, where, where do we want to put these buttons? Do we want them to be spaced out really far? Or do we want them to be real close together? I mean, we can always change it after, but... <laughs> want to make them, like... Have them be real, uh, real tight in the middle? Or do we want them to be way out the edges? <laughs> close together? Okay, well, we'll go, like, uh, we'll go with uh, maybe, like, one. So right up, right up in the middle. Finish. And then uh, I need to change a few of the numbers. I think that number is okay. Uh, I think we can drop them in now, basically. So I'm gonna grab, oh, I'm gonna save this, save the button, and drag in the button. Maybe we will need to make all four colors just to complete the effect. <laughs> um, if we do a joint here to here. Uh, okay, so I do need to change, uh, looks like our whole, uh, the chamfers on the hole are too big. Um, they are making it just look silly. Uh, let me find that chamfer. It's one of these. I'm no, not one of those. Where, where, where is that chamfer? It's not that one. Uh, where, where's the, this one? No. Extrude, extrude, cham chamfer? Ah, here it is. This one, uh, point one. Gotta make that real tiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm gonna, let's see, do we wanna make all four colors? Do, is that is that necessary to complete the effect? <laughs> See how much time, oh, we got plenty of time. Yeah, let's make all four colors, why not? Um, open the other colors so I have them. And we're gonna bring up our little one. So I'm gonna make copies. Uh, copy, okay. Copy. Copy. Name Hello Blue Green Hello There we go. Green Blue. Okay. I need to go grab those colors here. So I'm actually gonna just gonna do these all at the same time. So we have yellow, uh, copy to my appearances, green, copy to my appearances, blue, copy to my appearances, and we have our red, which we already made. So now I can make our yellow, so Hide appearances, bring in yellow, apply it, uh, close and save. Hop over to the green one, hide the body, apply the appearance, boop, and save. And last, not least, blue, apply the appearance, bring back save. Okay, so I think that is all the buttons made. We have our three buttons. <laughs> um, and so we can bring in our yellow button. Bring in our blue button. And bring in our green button. 
this is maybe taking the whole changing parameters to an extreme thing, but you can see it didn't take a lot of work for us to get to having an entirely different size of thing. We mostly were able to just reuse everything we already had. Um, it wasn't perfect. There was a few little things we had to change there because of uh, real world dimensions being essentially arbitrary. So if you chamfer 0.5 off of something, that's going to change depending on the size of the object at a pretty arbitrary rate because someone's going to be doing that to I, uh, to whatever looks good on the size, and that will change inconsistently. Um, so you can't always make everything change just off one number. It doesn't really work. But Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so we have our, our wonderful... Um, Let's let's go ahead and look at it in the render pane. Why not? We have our wonderful uh, tiny challenge version of <laughs> so tiny. Wait, are they are they all the same height? Like the red one almost looks like it's a little lower, but no, I think I, okay, no, they're the same. Yes, yeah, so we got our uh, tiny ones with our wonderful. <laughs> Oh, it's so, they're so tiny. Um, let's see, th does that look sillier, or does it look sillier if we, uh, if we make them, like, absurdly fit far apart? Let's, let's hop back over into that sketch and change that number. Um, if I go back into that sketch we had right, nope, not that one. This one, nope. This one. This one, yep. If I change this instead of one, if I make this... Uh, let's figure out what number it has to be at. Nope, not far enough. We put them right on the edge like we had the other ones. Oh, not able to solve 40. Okay, uh, 35. Uh, 38. 40. Why isn't it able to solve 40? Oh, there it goes. 48. There we go, right on the edges. <laughs> that just looks weird now. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, hello, Linko the Hero. Yeah, so if you aren't familiar, uh, the game Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes is a, uh, Called a communication game, uh, in which the goal is to defuse a bomb. Yep. So we were making a module. Uh, this is more of a joke. Uh, so we had made uh, last yeah yet last stream. Uh, we had made sorry for the invisible buttons. Um, they're green, so they're invisible. Um, so we had made this module, and it was rather small. So we went through the process of upgrading it to using larger buttons. Um, to more closely match the one in game. And so the result of that was we created this module. Um, so I go into the render view so it looks a little more appropriate. Uh, there we go. So we had created this module, which is using the new buttons and much more uh, akin to what the actual game has it look like. Um, but to take the, the, so basically we'd only just change the tributes of that to see what it would do. Um, and to basically just take it way too far, we decided to make, uh, a module with really, really tiny buttons. <laughs> um, mostly because we only have a, a, I don't know, about, uh, eh, 15 minutes left on the stream. Uh, so we were just messing around. <laughs> Putting, uh, well, just, <laughs> Hmm. I mean, arguably, yes. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the game, I can actually bring up what it looks like here. Um, it is a... Uh, pro probably one of my favorite things about it is just how inefficient the manuals are. Um, let me enable mods like usual. Uh, close... So a normal game might look something like, uh, if it 
Give me a second to load it. Yeah, it's one of our favorites in the VR studio as well because this game was basically designed for VR and then it got added to everything else uh, too, which was great. Um, let me add some time onto this. Start. <laughs> yeah, VR version is uh, definitely a little more stressful. We'll see how real life version goes because uh, I think it might be more threatening to have it be real. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this uh, in game is actually not all that big. Um, the one that we're designing here is kind of humongous compared to the. Uh... So one of the modules in this one is this large. Um, so, it's going to be half a meter wide, um, by, like, that tall. So, it's, it's huge. It's going to be extremely heavy. I have a feeling it's not even going to be something we're going to have people pick up because it's so heavy, uh, with batteries in it. Um, and the edges will be much larger. But, yeah, so we're creating... Oh, there was no Simon on this one. Uh, make a... <laughs> Get one with Simon, preferably. Uh, retry. Surprised there was no modded on that actually. Maybe I've disabled modded temporarily. For the customs. There's Simon. <laughs> so I think our new design for Simon actually gets pretty close to what it looks like in game. Um, this is definitely not quite the aspect ratio of Simon from the game. Uh, or the, not aspect ratio, the, the, the little buttons are quite small. Um, I think our new design is much closer. <laughs> so hopefully this will be very close. Because um, that is my goal primarily in this design is... While I would like to match the appearance as closely as possible to all modules in game... Um, it's one of my goals, and I've gotten very close with modules like Maze and Simon. Um, <laughs> the tiny buttons. Uh, maybe I'll make that like a... I mean, so I have this already. I have all the parts for it. So I might use this for... Uh, I might have this follow the rules of not Simon or something like that. Because there are modded versions of these modules that have different rules and could work for that different size. Um, yeah, so some of these, so yeah, this, this is a good example of one of the ones. This is impossible. Um, these are printed labels and yet they change. If I, if something changes, they are changing what's on them, which makes no sense. Um, and so that's one of the modules I have to change when it comes to making it real. Um, whereas things like wires, keypads, uh, this is another one I have to change. I have to make these little screens and not, uh, buttons. This is fine, this is fine, uh, this is possible, this is possible, this is technically not possible. Um, so one of the things that I've run into more and more is that you'll realize that these things like these screens don't exist. Um, Morse code module. You say that, that's actually one of the modules I've been working on. Um, <laughs> And mine is quite different from the one in game. Uh, I can actually bring up the. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Um, I don't have a CAD version of it, but I do have a sketch of it. Uh, it is one of the ones I've had to change a bit. <laughs> um, because Morse, as it's shown in game, is completely possible. But it's not really very interesting physically, as far as I'm concerned. Um, which maybe, maybe I'm being too, uh, maybe I want it to be different because it, I feel like it's have like a tuning dial. So that's what I've made it into. Um, so I have a sketch here of what that would look like if I can find it. Uh, where did I put that sketch? Not there, not there. Um... Oh, I guess I can also show what uh, some of the other modules look like at the moment. Um, but I know I have... Let's see. Where do... I, I know I have scanned in 
what that will look like at some point. There it is. Um, yeah, so I've got, here we go, I've got lots of images up. Um, pop back over. So this is currently what the circuitry I have looks like. It is still a jumble of wires for Morse. Um, but there is a tuning p uh, potentiometer, a display for the actual um, signal you're on. And I've actually added a VU meter uh, as a way to kind of, and it actually, I'm using a, so this is a Vespa bulb, a bulb that was meant for a Vespa's instrument panel. Um, happens to glow very nicely. Um, and so I'm using that as the Morse bulb in place of the one in game. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, all of these, I feel like actually look more threatening in their like development stage when there's wires everywhere than they do when they're complete. They look pretty polished when they're done. Um, I've gotten in an old, uh, dial from a radio. Um, and then I think I have a photo of, uh, yeah. So there's the final layout I'm using. Um, this is what I've, I sketched up in my notebook. So I've got a tuning dial, a transmit button. Um, weird things happening? Okay, sorry. If there's weird flashes on screen, uh, I'm seeing that occasionally on my monitor. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but I've got the VU meter and the tuning. So the idea is you actually have to rotate the knob to the right spot like you would a real radio um, instead of, and you'll have to kind of tune it in instead of it just working uh, via button presses like before. Um, I feel like it's more appropriate for the, uh, the feel of the game um, to have it be that way. Uh, same with Morse, or sorry, not Morse, uh, Memory. Uh, these are actually using Nixie tubes, which look like that. <laughs> um, but these will be Nixie tubes down the bottom. And let me actually see if I, I think I have a, um, an image of what they look like lit. Uh, although we did have a stream a few weeks back where we were showing that, uh, messing with them. Um, yes, here they are. This is what those numbers look like when they're lit. Um, which I absolutely love the appearance of Nixie tubes. I think they're amazing looking. Um, so they'll be a lot of fun. Um, so we have the four Nixies on the bottom and then this one large Nixie tube uh, up top. Let's see. Um, yeah, this is the uh, display being used for uh, venting gas. And yes, this looks terrifying. Um, I was trying to figure out what the stability issue was. And so there are a ton of capacitors that don't need to be there. Um, yeah, this is, but yeah, it looks terrifying. Uh, and then Mazes is actually in its basically complete form display-wise. Um, I'm really happy with how this one is looking so far. Um, of all things, this is actually a 3D printed piece with printer paper over the top of it. Um, so you can see the back here is panels that have been soldered together. Uh, they're just LEDs, and then I think the appearance is close to what the, the in-game one looks like. Um, I think I might have a... Let me see if I can find a little video clip of what it looks like in action. Um, it's more complicated than I thought it would be. <laughs> uh, I feel that. I started this almost a year ago now. And I am still barely in the... I feel like I'm barely in the beginning phases of it. Um, from how much... Because it really is just there's so much in this game. Um, and they... Obviously a lot of the forethought is done on their part. But uh, yeah, communication between modules. Um, the actual construction of them. Uh, oh, I think I... Okay, I do have um, some images of what some of the modules look like. Let's see here. Uh... You, I had some. They're just further back in my timeline than I thought they'd be. Um, I guess I can show the structure underlying the mazes module too, which I think is a pretty cool looking thing. Um, okay, I got way more pictures here. Uh, and which one of these is the video? There it is. Okay. Okay, back over into photos. <laughs> Um, so I have the timer. Uh, it is not fully functional, but you can see the appearance of it. Um, these are alphanumeric displays, which I think is what the intent of the game was. Uh, they don't look quite like this, but I think it's close. Um, 
here is the passwords module um, as I've been designing it. So it's just doing the standard thing I do, which is to have random letters. So, um, but I, so I actually designed my own font and implemented it to match the game. And I think that has come out pretty well. So that's an ongoing development. So these are the different stages of maze. Um, there's a 3D printed piece to kind of allow the uh, alignment to work. And then I put a piece of printer paper over that to kind of diffuse it out. And then there's a clear layer that's kind of that darkening layer. And so when they're all stacked together, it makes this really nice looking, uh, almost, it almost looks like a display, but it doesn't have a resolution that kind of has that nice warm look to it. Um, and so this is the current state of that. I just have the buttons on the sides. Eventually they'll be around the edges. Um, but this is the this is the first module I've actually made fully work. Um, so it's it's not quite it doesn't look good like Simon does yet. I'm gonna hopefully do that soon. Um, but it's the first one that actually functions as the moduling game. And I think yeah, you can see there's the test pattern when I was testing it. Uh, you can see how the LEDs are arranged. Um, and then so this is. Uh, for who's on first. Um, these are the little screens I'm using for the buttons there um, with a multiplexer. Uh, so that that has been coming along well. There's that Nix, that Nixie I was talking about before, that big round one that goes on top. So it'll be a combination of this and where did that... There we go. So you can imagine uh, this being above and these being below for the memory module. Uh, I'm excited for how that'll look when I put it together. Uh, I'm getting pretty close there. And then finally, uh, the serial number is actually using an e-paper display, which is a really cool technology that allows you to have a screen that has no light emitting from it. Um, you can see it refreshing here. It kind of does this weird flickering process where it has to erase and then recreate the colors. Um, but it allows you to have a literally paper-like display that can change for each time uh, digitally. Uh, you may have seen the <laughs> yeah I I I was amazed when I saw these two with multiple colors. Um, so you may have actually be f been familiar with these. These are what are used in things like Nooks and uh, other e-readers that have that like where they don't actually have a. Um, yeah, like it's completely convincing. Uh, where they don't have any look to like be a screen, those the older style nooks and uh, like the I guess the um, oh goodness, what was whatever the Amazon brand ones are, maybe they are nooks. Um, like that whole thing, that's how they used to it. That's why they would the whole screen would flash when you change the page, is because it's actually so what's in these, and like you can't see it here. But they're actually screens made out of tiny little modules, uh, like little bubbles. And they're full of mag uh, electromagnetically conductive or, or uh, reactive particles of dye. And so what it's doing here where you see it like flashing is it's charging up one side of the screen, then the other, then one, then the other. And so those little particles like migrate through the uh, little bubbles toward either the front or the back of the screen. And so, uh, and, and, they're, and they take different amounts of time to migrate. And so what it can do to make black versus red is it's basically attracting one and pushing the other away from that side. So you can see it's basically doing like three stages here, right? So it'll restart in a second here. Um, so you can see it's when it, very, when it first starts out, it basically flashes the whole screen over and over. That's a refresh. And basically what it's trying to do is just trying to make sure everything is broken away from the edges and is able to move around. And so here it's, and, and then so it goes through the process of then it starts pushing those little particles into one way. And then the reason it goes from black, the top goes black and then red, to my understanding of how this works, is it basically, when it does the black, it shoves all the particles to one side and then it basically pulls the black ones back. And since the red ones are bigger, when it pulls those black ones away, like right now, it allows the red to show through. Um, and supposedly you can do this with more than just two colors, more than black and red. 
Um, I know there's black and yellow and black and blue. I've seen those. But supposedly you can have all like a full color display this way, but it takes like five seconds to change what it's showing or longer. Um, so these aren't really practical. We've decided, uh, so I've decided personally to only use uh, e-paper for uh, the serial number like this. And we'll also be using it for the uh, indicators. So the, the ones that have the three letter FRK, CAR, those kind of indicators will also have these same paper tags um, that allows them to change like, and so because they only change the beginning and end of a round, it's completely fine. They take like this, like five second or 10 second period of time for them to change what's on them. Um, uh, because it can completely randomly generate one, which is anytime I can take the human out of having to do something for this to work is positive in my view. Um, because optimally, uh, someone someone's going to have to go like set it up each time, but preferably setting it up does not give you a significant advantage when you're playing it. Um, so that's my goal, is that it tells you what to do. You have no idea how to actually solve it before that. Um, so like, uh, same with Maze. It'll tell you where to put the dots, but it won't show you what the solution is at that point. Or um, with some modules, like who's on first or... Uh, memory, I mean, they're going to randomly assign themselves as soon as you start the game. Same with Simon. So, yeah, hopefully this works. Um, but we're still in pretty early development right now uh, on the project. I mean, I'm a year in, but that doesn't mean I'm... Uh, this isn't a year-long project. This is probably something like three years. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with the progress we have made so far. Um if anyone is curious, uh, I'm going to actually put a link straight to it. Last week we had kind of circumvented it. Um, but I realized that just because I started the server doesn't mean there's any reason why I should not link it and link the real, the official one anyway. Because um, it, I, I began it, but uh, there is now an official keep talking and nobody explodes uh, build server. <laughs> Uh, for official builds. So this is the link to that if anyone's interested. Um, and yeah, there's lots of people building these now, which is really cool. Um, and we, there's even now people who have made them so good that other people are building their designs. So uh, yeah, this is now a community project, very much so. Um, and I'm super happy to see how things are going. Um, but... Yeah, so my build is uh, very... I, I'm trying to be very faithful to the original design, the look of it. Um, I want mine to work with the original manual, which is a big... Uh, a lot of people are willing to make concessions to that, um, which I think is completely reasonable. It's way more work than it should be uh, to make things work as they are in-game. But I really want the original manual... It's backward. Um, <laughs> to work with my version. Um just because I think it's cool to have something so close to the real game that I don't even have to change more than a few words. Like, someone could figure it out from the original manual, even if it uh, looks a little different. So, cool, there's that tab. Yeah, in general, and I'll just say this, like, if people are interested in playing the game, Keep Talking Nobody Explodes has an amazing community. Um, there's obviously our real, build serve, our real builds community, but there are communities around different play styles. There's a whole modding community that is really, really active, and they're constantly like developing new modules for the game. Um, the Steel Crate games themselves are, I don't see on there very often, but they don't need to be as the original devs. Uh, yeah, community, the community for Keep Talking Up Explodes is really fun because um, everyone's just there to enjoy themselves and mess around with uh, an admittedly very hard team team game. Um, cause that's really what it is. It's, it's a team game. And so I'm trying to do the same thing here. Uh, all of it is going to be open sourced because of course it will be. Um, yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe we'll include this in the source. I don't know if there's going to be a use for, uh, insanely tiny button Simon, but, uh, <laughs> I guess it exists now. <laughs> yeah, I'll save that. Um, but I guess you. I guess you could take this and like add way more buttons in between. That would be like an evil version of Simon. 
but uh, yeah, so that's um, we're, it's about eight o'clock. So I think we're gonna wrap up in just a minute here. If anyone has any more questions or uh, something I can respond to, let me know. I'll be. I think I'm gonna stay around here for a couple more minutes. Um, we did start late, but uh, yeah, that this is the current state of the project. Um, at least my my version of the project, we'll say. Uh, obviously, other people are ahead of me. Some people are behind. Me. Um, I was far from the first person to come up with the idea of making this game. Uh, I found out after creating the server that there were uh, probably close to seven or eight other people already working on this project, um, all independently in their own areas. And so it's now become kind of an international effort. <laughs> um, but that, that's the enjoyable part. That's, that's the beautiful part of uh, open communities and the making community in general is that when everything's open source and everyone's trying to help out, you kind of get to share notes and uh, create cool stuff while you're at it. Um, and we, we encourage that in the, in the library, of course, too. Uh, we love our open source projects and uh, I believe the library generally open sources all of the stuff we make. So things like the door counter we have in our, in the makerspace that we've designed, I believe is uh, available on the, on the uh, official NCSU libraries GitHub. Um, GitHub is kind of where everything goes these days. <laughs> uh, this included, I use GitHub. But yeah, uh, so I think we're going to be wrapping up for tonight. I'll pop this back up. So hope everyone enjoyed this stream. I know we got started a bit late, but I think it kind of worked out timing wise. Uh, this is a much more casual stream because of it. And Kind of like that in a way. We didn't have everything prepped we uh, originally would have. But, yeah. So this was a lot of fun for me. I uh, hope you all enjoyed as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So you all have a good night. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, don't forget to be awesome, as they say. 